Thanks for tuning in to this video weather briefing. The topic of this discussion will be to provide an update on El Nino and expected impacts. Thanks for watching this briefing and also remember to join Weather Ready Nation as an ambassador. Today's date is November 16th, 2015. This video is about 10 minutes long. Here's typically what happens in El Nino. It's actually the jet stream which changes in response to sea surface temperatures over the warmer than usual equatorial Pacific Ocean. So in essence, our jet stream that's typically moving across Oregon and Washington in the Pacific Northwest will move southward across Southern California as shown here and exit across Texas and Florida. This is what results in the increased storminess or more frequent storms, not necessarily more powerful storms, and also an extended longer winter which in essence brings our very wet conditions that we see in typical strong El Ninos. This here shows what our current El Nino, which formed over the summer, looks like. Also note there are two large areas of very warm water in the eastern Pacific. Where did those come from? Those resulted from the lack of storms over the past two years. Significant warming of the Pacific Ocean due to increased sunshine, less wave activity, and less upwelling. On the right hand side is your typical strong El Nino, and you can see often that is a ribbon across the equatorial Pacific Ocean, and some of that warm water does tend to spill northward up towards the Baja, as shown here. However, we are not typically used to seeing conditions where most of the Pacific Ocean is above normal. How warm has it been thanks to the very warm water and the ongoing drought? The month of October shattered records. Along the coast, it's most obvious as you see the red areas because of the very warm sea surface temperatures from the blob regions. And then across central and northern California, mostly the result of the weather pattern or lack of storms and also the dry ground. This year, as similar to 2014, is near the pace of being the warmest year on record for California. In fact, over the past four years, the warming has been substantial. We have not seen a period over the past four years or 48 months that has seen this much warmth in terms of the average temperature. That includes the high temperature, low temperature, average together, as shown here. Also note that with our ongoing drought, the loss of precipitation has been significant. The deep shaded red areas are one to two years of precipitation just out of the past four that we missed. This is all courtesy of the ongoing drought or lack of storm tracks moving across California. What we typically associate El Nino with is rain and flooding. However, what we'll discuss here in the next couple slides is actually the mechanism of El Nino, which is not equal to rain or storms. In fact, what it is is above normal sea surface temperatures along the equatorial Pacific Ocean, which occurs every three to six years. Those warm ocean temperatures well south of Hawaii, once they become strong and interact with our normal jet stream in the Pacific, that can change our weather pattern, at least for the winter time temporarily, and bring us the increased storminess. The accumulated result or impact from these additional storms or the storm track being locked in across Southern California is what ends up resulting in the rainfall and the potential flooding. Here's what we mean. Typically in the Western Pacific is where you find the warmest water, the tropical regions. Now the trade winds which blow from east to west keep those waters there. That's also the source region where we see some intense hurricanes and typhoons. Also, just generally a lot of tropical weather and thunderstorms. Eventually that area gets too warm and it overcomes the trade winds sending the wind from west to east across our region. That is shown here. This is a reversal of the trade winds and that in result allows the warm water to move across the equator, hit South America, basically overriding the currents and warming water spreads all the way up to Mexico, Baja, and south across South America, as shown here. So basically it's a response to the excessive warming and heat content of the Western Pacific. And this is the ocean's way of neutralizing or redistributing that heat and energy. 
Over the past couple years, we've seen nothing like an El Nino weather pattern, and that's also because El Nino just recently formed. But this severe drought has brought the complete opposite, taking the storm track well to our north, completely missing us, as shown here on the left-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side is a composite average of the jet stream or storm track, which is up where airplanes fly. That is what we typically see in a strong El Nino. As you can see here, it's a direct hit when you have a strong El Nino. That elongated Pacific jet stream that we shift southward and consolidate it, focusing on Southern California. What our oceans look like now, and when we refer to El Nino, what we're referring to is ocean sea surface temperatures. That in a result will change pressure patterns and also change the jet stream pattern. Now, currently our El Nino is reaching levels we haven't seen before, as shown here. And in fact, the entire Pacific Ocean is largely above normal. What we typically see as we get into the winter is that the ocean along the equator, that warm water, and our normal jet stream that's dropping southward tend to interact or become coupled together. That basically is the result of separation of very warm air to the south and then cooler air to the north. And that's all the jet stream is, is that separation. But it's important because it creates our storm track. As we go into November, December, that storm track in the strong El Nino years tends to shift further south with time. And then eventually it remains locked in place, as shown between January and March. Some of our wettest months on record have been during strong El Ninos, and especially the latter half of the year, which is the end of the winter or the second half of the winter from January through March. And in some cases, we see the effects of El Nino continuing all the way through April and part of May with increased storminess and cooler conditions. How strong is our current El Nino? Well, an image here is a composite of one month. And we can see the heart of El Nino is very intense, elongated from west to east. That is the warm water that our jet stream will eventually interact with as it shifts southward. Also note the large area of warm water which extends from the Baja of Mexico out into much of the eastern Pacific Ocean. The water along the equator, that warm water, that's what we call El Nino and it's at least as big as the United States on land. So you can imagine how much energy and heat content that is across the ocean. That's the region we focus on when we call El Nino. Now, in the past, a few El Ninos have weakened rapidly as we entered into the heart of the winter or entered into December. However, this El Nino is expected to remain this strong because of the extensive amount of warm water that's deep down in the ocean. So think of that as a reservoir of warm water. That warm water has been around for a while and some of it has slowly lifted upward towards the surface. Now, the image here shows El Nino, and it developed in April and May. Focus on the rectangle area. That's the heart of El Nino, Nino 3.4. And most recently, the weekly average temperature for that region is 3 Celsius, or almost about 6 Fahrenheit. We have not seen a value that high in that particular region. And it even exceeds the 97, 98, at least for the weekly sea surface temperature. We can't declare it the strongest El Nino on record, though, until we have a couple months of the average exceeding prior values. Our outlook, as shown here, is for the southern part of the United States that have the best chance for precipitation and above normal precipitation. Meanwhile, to the north, especially the northern Rockies and part of the Pacific Northwest, the dryness should continue and expand and also above normal temperatures. Partly due to the lack of the storm track, mostly visiting Southern California in the heart of the winter, and also due to the lack of polar air or Arctic air coming down from the north, which tends to be suppressed or overcome by these strong El Ninos. Temperature-wise for our region, our record-breaking temperatures that we've seen this fall and also over the past two years, those should be eased quite a bit due to cloud cover, rainfall, and moistening soil conditions. But still, not making us below normal. Here's a zoomed up version. You can see our region here in Southern California has the highest probability of exceeding normal rainfall or getting much above normal rainfall 
and then of course the impacts that come from too much rain which includes flooding urban small stream rivers landslides and other types of activity such as coastal erosion from repeated storms it's important to note that the highest probability for this above normal precipitation is the latter part of the winter that is sometime in december all the way through march here's a zoomed up version you can see our region here in southern california has the highest probability of exceeding normal rainfall or getting much above normal rainfall and then of course the impacts that come from too much rain which includes flooding urban small stream rivers landslides and other types of activity such as coastal erosion from repeated storms it's important to note that the highest probability for this above normal precipitation is the latter part of the winter that is sometime in december all the way through march Here's a summary of what we talked about. We are looking at an El Nino, which is a normal occurrence every three to six or seven years. Basically, the trade winds are overcoming the water can spread east. However, what is not typical is the strength of this El Nino. Some impacts are listed here as the warm ocean temperatures outside of El Nino in the blob regions should enhance our storms as well as the storms move over that warm, unstable water. So El Nino is not the strongest storms on record necessarily, but it does mean it brings us frequent storms, numerous storms, over a prolonged, extended winter. It doesn't guarantee above normal precipitation, but here in Southern California, by far and large, we have the best correlation. We have also seen bigger storms in non-El Nino years, so that's also important to note. If we were to get the combination of a very intense one-week storm on top of already saturated conditions, it would really be a big impact. We're asking everyone to make sure if they live in a flood prone area to have flood insurance. Otherwise, check out the map at the link below to see if you need flood insurance or visit FEMA or also check out your public works website in your county as well as your fire department who may have sandbags available for you. All those sandbags not necessarily come full, so please check with your local authorities on that. Do what you can now to clear up storm drains and remove debris around your house. Here are some links for monitoring the weather. The El Nino updates come in the link at the bottom. And then the links above, you can monitor real-time weather, included watches, warnings, and advisories. And if you like to look at particular weather stations or rainfall amounts and maybe peak wind gusts, you can also use those links here. Stay tuned as we'll have more updates on this upcoming El Nino as well as frequent updates for actual individual storms. This has been Alex Tardy, Meteorologist, National Weather Service.